The following program contains adult themes. Some scenes may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. When two people fall in love, can their passion create evil? And can a woman dream of murder so strongly that her boyfriend will kill her? She is a pathological liar. She's a borderline schizophrenic. She is a junkie. And uh, I think Elizabeth Hasem wouldn't know the truth if it hit her right between the eyes. I'm an impulsive, irrational, emotional person. I, I spit things out. I write things down. I don't think about them. I forget about them. And a lot of the things I've said and done are are rational and illogical. I think she would do whatever th she thought was necessary to gain whatever ends she was seeking. And if it took murder, yeah, I think she would do it. Elizabeth Hasem and her boyfriend Yen Sui had a passionate but poisonous love affair, and their passion led to murder. On April 4th, 1985, Elizabeth's parents were found stabbed to death at the rural Virginia estate. Their opulent dining room had been daubed with blood and strange symbols. But the seeds of this murder were sown two years earlier when Elizabeth fell in love with Yens and her dreams became a blueprint for a killing. When two people fall in love, the bond they form is enormously strong. They live for each other. They share each other's dreams. They want to fulfill each other's needs and desires. But what happens when those needs and fantasies have no limits? when the desire is for death. I'm Teresa Saldana, and this is Confessions of Crime. It is a tragic irony that the bloody murder of Derek and Nancy Hasem should have occurred because of their daughter's love affair, something that normally signals a child's transition to adulthood. But the obsessive feelings Elizabeth Hasem experienced with her boyfriend, Yen Sori, signal not maturity, but an immature fantasy that eventually took both her parents' lives. Tonight, we'll see through the eyes of Elizabeth Hasem her terrible fantasies were realized. Elizabeth Hasem and Yen Sori met at the University of Virginia. She had been raised in a privileged elite society. She was polished, accomplished, and artistic. Jens was born in Germany. He was shy, intellectual, and practical. They made a strange couple whose affair was driven by an intellectual attraction. Even so, it was astonishingly passionate and obsessive, and they declared their love in dozens of letters. My dearest Jens, I love you. I love you now. I love you eternally. The most important person in my life. I do love you more than I've loved anybody. And I love you differently than I've loved anybody before. She was the belle of the ball that year. Everybody wanted to spend time with her. She's very attractive, she's witty, she's unusual. And she could have had her pick. And here she picks this sort of pasty looking dwarf that nobody liked very much. He was a very, very unlikely choice for her. I think Yen's probably just was riding on, on as high a high as he'd ever been uh, when, when he and Elizabeth first started going together because he was this very, very attractive, very brilliant, very seductive woman who was paying attention to him. And this was just more than his psyche could stand almost. I'm not perfect. I was ranked fifth in a mediocre school with mediocre people. I'm so hopeless. I qualify as a village idiot at best. I love you so fiercely. Elizabeth had a troubled childhood. Her parents were rich and successful and set extremely high standards for their daughter. Elizabeth was sent away to exclusive boarding schools in England. As she escaped from the bonds of home, she became eccentric, bohemian, and a drug user. She escaped into a world of fantasy weaving secret dreams inside her own head. I was raised to believe I could be anything I wanted to be. I would read about a character and say, that's an interesting way to be. 
I think I'll be that way for a week or two. At the time, I believe I thought that when I needed them when I was younger, they weren't there for me. Probably, as I say, it's a bogey in my own head because maybe if I'd reached out a bit more, they would have been there for me. But I thought that they had not been there for me. I'd been alone for all those years. And then when I'd come back, when I was at UVA, they were overwhelming me, smothering me with attention. At the University of Virginia, Jens Soaring was studying engineering. The son of a German diplomat, he too had a troubled childhood and domineering parents. Jens was an intelligent young man, but again, you have to recognize that intelligence and maturity are two different uh, concepts. And while Jens may have been able to recite a lot of uh, Shakespeare quotes and uh, tell you uh, what the major export crop of Afghanistan was, um, he wasn't necessarily uh, as advanced uh, emotionally. I felt this, I'm feeling it now, the need to plant one's foot in someone's face, to always crush. The letters show that they did feel as though they had found soulmates. This is an example of a letter that, that Elizabeth wrote to Jens over the holiday break. My mother went to her hair appointment three days late. My father and I cut down cedars for Christmas presents. Would it be possible to hypnotize my parents, do voodoo on them, will them to death? It seems my concentration on their death is causing them problems. My father nearly drove over a cliff at lunch. He nearly got squashed by a tree when he got home, and he keeps falling over. And my mother, drunk, fell into the fire. I think I shall seriously take up black magic. You admit that you placed the idea of your parents' death in the mind of Jan Soren. But he obviously knew from, as you, as you pointed out my letters, that I had feelings about my parents that I, I didn't want them in my life, yes. Elizabeth may have made a fatal mistake in encouraging Jens's dark side in revealing to him her own fantasies of her parents being gone, being dead. Uh, he seemed to be taking all of this much more seriously. He, though he didn't appear to be a terribly physical person, he had a very violent nature. These are Jens's words. This is the big horror, the taste you have in your mouth when you wake up in the morning. The taste of death, of your ubiquitous enemy's blood that you drank in, in your sleep and that you drink every night. Civilization, whether in the form of mouthwash or taboos, will try to remove that taste of and awful blood. But when we wake up every morning, it is there, it is real. And then, He goes on and he says, um, There is that other side that what speaks of, that deep-seated recognition that I'm not only my brother's keeper, I am my brother and everyone and everyone, everything else, including and maybe especially those I gun down in some form or another. I have not explored the side of me that wishes to crush to any real extent. I have yet to kill, possibly the ultimate act of crushing, with the possible exception of sex. In her letters, Elizabeth had hinted repeatedly at what she wanted, her parents out of her life. Yen started to take her dreams to heart. No one truly knows why Elizabeth despised her parents so much, but her hatred for them became her driving force. She had felt alone for all of her childhood, and now she felt smothered and oppressed. They had to die. But who was going to take the next horrifying step? How was it that Elizabeth's fantasies could become an all too real tragedy? Stay with us. Was Elizabeth Hasem using her love affair with Yen Soaring to fulfill her deepest fantasy, the death of her parents? Was Elizabeth in love? Or had she found the perfect Patsy, a man who would kill for her? After months of hinting and plotting, the fantasy was about to become reality. Their discussions began to focus on murder. I'm afraid, sir, that it was a fantasy of mine for many years that my parents would die. I don't think they started out by talking about plans to kill our parents. They started talking about a different things. It, it, it just evolved into this, and they said, gosh, wouldn't it be great to plan a perfect murder? 
because they love to play an intellectual game. And, and pretty soon they said, well, if we can have a perfect murder, murder, we may as well have a perfect victim. Let's take my parents, which I suspect Elizabeth had in the back of her mind all the time. And, and again, I, I think that she was cultivating Jens along these lines, and she led him into this. Elizabeth by herself is not a murderess. Jens Suring by himself was not a murderer. Together, somehow, they conspired, perhaps unconsciously on her part, but somehow the result of these two coming together was murder. I see this as something that that was only premeditated as a fan fantasy. It ended up becoming a reality, but I don't think it's because of any conscious plotting. And Jens, she found someone to whom she could relate. Then she began a manipulation with him involving her parents. Um, they don't approve of you, but I love you so much that I don't care. I don't care if they cut me out of their inheritance. She would talk of her inheritance as though there were millions of dollars there. In fact, there were not. Um, they are furious with me, but I, I love you so much I don't care. It, it gave her kind of um, extra credit as far as, as caring about him, and I, I think that's why she did it, and I think she knew probably consciously knew what she was doing in, in manipulating him that way. Jens was a very practical man, and together they devised a complex alibi to cover their murderous schemes. Their story was that they had gone to Washington for the weekend, which was about 250 miles, and they'd gone up there to spend the weekend just to get away from the grind of school. And later it, determined, it was determined that they were trying to build an alibi for their absence, to try to show they were somewhere else when the murders were committed. And the, the investigator who was looking at this looked at the rental car mileage and he said they could not have run up that many miles just driving to Washington and driving back. So the only plausible excuse was they'd driven to Washington, at least one of them came back, or the car came back to Lynchburg, and went back to Washington and then back to Charlottesville. And that totaled almost exactly the number of miles of one aerodometer. Even though the murder was still Elizabeth's fantasy, it was becoming all too real. She and Jens had plotted it down to the last detail. They booked a hotel room in Washington and devised a clever scam to disguise their killing spree. This was all part of the plan. What I was supposed to do was I was supposed to be in the shower when the room service arrived so that it would look like I was in the shower with Jens and I would come out of the shower with a towel wrapped around me and um, I would pick up the room service receipt and I would take it, carry it back into the shower with me, forge his signature and bring it back out again so that that would show that he was there. Did you want him to kill you? Yes, I did. As Jens drove through the dusk, Derek and Nancy were finishing dinner at home. It would be their last meal together. In the kitchen, Yen stabbed Nancy eight times in the face and chest. Derek was in the dining room. He was stabbed 38 times, and his throat repeatedly slashed. Five days later, their bodies were found. There was no sign of forced entry, and the crime scene was horrifying. There were bizarre signs of a voodoo ceremony. Bloody footprints like a ritualistic dance were visibly etched on the floor, and the number 666 had been carved into the wooden floorboards. All she had to do sometime during that four hours is just pick up a phone and say, Mom and Dad, something's wrong with Jens. He's mad. He's upset. He's coming. Don't let him there. Call the police. I love you. Mom and Dad, I care for you. I don't want you to die. Jens had committed the ultimate crime. At Elizabeth's instigation and inspiration, he had killed. Egged on by her fantasies, the deed was done. Was this murder the proof of their strange love for each other? Would it bring them even closer together? Or was it the beginning of the end of their deadly passion? Stay with us. Elizabeth's parents had been murdered, and the police wanted the killers. Jens fled. Elizabeth was not far behind. Elizabeth and Jens were now partners in crime. Would the death of her parents mark the death of their love? After the murder, Elizabeth and Jens fled to Europe, and their lives disintegrated. 
from a position of wealth and privilege, they had doomed themselves to a life of petty crime. Elizabeth had fantasized the murder, but she had failed to plan for what she and her lover would become. Two people on the run from the police. They depended on crime to, to a large extent for, for survival. And I think they, they read it in a book. They went out, they did, like good students, they went to the library and they checked out books on, on, on schemes and frauds and how to get, how to do this and how to do that. And they settled on one or two and they said, we're going to do this. Eventually, Jens and Elizabeth's luck caught up with them. They were arrested in London, not for murder, but for a department store scam. The police searched their flat and found the dozens of incriminating letters. What did they mean? Were they clues to a murder? Elizabeth and Jens were kept apart, and the British police played them against each other. It was the end of the affair, end of their love. Eventually, they turned on each other. They became enemies, and Elizabeth became the principal witness at Jens's trial. As their separation increased, they became more and more disenchanted with each other. And by the time she came back to the United States to, uh, to, to stand trial or to plead guilty or whatever, she was ready to throw all the blame on Jens. I do not mean to minimize my guilt. What I did, what I said, what I failed to do, my, my irresponsibility, my, my manipulation of Jens, yes, I am totally guilty. I'm totally responsible for my parents' death. I accept that. But what I want you to realize is that Jens acted of his own free will. He had a choice. He had a choice. He had a four-hour drive. No matter what I said to him before that, no matter what I had written to him in months before that, he had a choice whether he killed my parents or not. He sat and talked with them. He had some kind of meal with them or something. He didn't have to do anything. Nobody forced him to do anything. And I never once believed that somebody liked Jens. something like that she didn't really believe that he 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 uh he was prepared to accept his responsibility he was he was more inclined to shift although she was willing to share the responsibility initially and, and try to protect him initially when they were first arrested in in, in, in london uh, she she came to the realization that that during the time that they were incarcerated that he was he, she, he seemed to her to be doing what he could do to shift as much of the responsibility to her. Jens was extradited back to the U.S., where in spite of his confessions in England, he pled not guilty. He claimed he had not committed the murders, that Elizabeth had fulfilled her own fantasies and killed her parents. The jury didn't believe him. Well, she started talking almost, you know, as she came in, um, very monotone, uh, you know, <laughs> Not a lot of, I guess you'd say, emotion, but like she was in shock. And um, basically kept repeating the same things over and over again. Uh, I've killed my parents, I've killed my parents. Um, you know, it wasn't her that it, it was the drugs that made her do it, okay? She said that a lot, you know, it wasn't me, it was the drugs that made me do it. And uh, that her parents deserved it anyway. And, um, you know, you've got to help me. If you don't help me, they'll kill me. And I mean, I, I knew what she meant by that. Um, yeah, execution. Even though Elizabeth was not present during the murders, she pled guilty. Why did she confess? Had the reality of what she had done pierced her veil of fantasy? Was it a plea for attention, or was it guilt? She, I think, felt a need to have to to, to purge her own self. Of, uh, whatever she did. She's still perhaps not real sure what exactly it was that she did. Didn't it occur to you at that moment, hey, wait a minute, this boy is taking this stuff serious? Yes, it did, sir. What'd you do to stop it? Absolutely nothing, sir. That's why I'm guilty. Is she remorseful about what she did, the participation in the murder of her own mother and father? And if she claims here today that she is, and if her attorney claims that she is, then I counter with this simple response, how in the world could she sleep with the man as a lover on the very night that her parents were buried? The night that 
that she attended the funeral service and this man being the very butcher who slashed them in the fashion that we've seen in those photographs. Sleep with him. Make love with him. Is that remorse, Sean? Elizabeth Hayson might be the coldest human being I've ever encountered in my 15 years of practicing law. Um, when I looked into her eyes during cross-examination at trial, there was nothing there but icicles. Um, she is a pathological liar. She's a borderline schizophrenic. She is a junkie. And uh, I think Elizabeth Hayson wouldn't know the truth if it hit her right between the eyes. For Elizabeth Hayson, this was a psychological crime in the purest sense. She wasn't there. She didn't stab her father 38 times. Yet her manipulating hand was present every time the knife plunged into his heart. How did this happen? Trust and passion can be strong and positive emotions in a normal, healthy relationship. But in the strange lover's knot of Elizabeth and Jens, trust led to blind acquiescence and evil manipulation. Passion led to murder. Elizabeth, with her life of play acting, had found the perfect foil in Jens. He longed to prove himself to her, and so he fulfilled her fantasies, turning her visions of murder into bloody and brutal acts. And now, having realized their worst desires, their dreams must take flight beyond prison walls, where Elizabeth Hasem is serving 90 years in the Goochland Correctional Facility, convicted of being an accessory before the fact. Her boyfriend, Jens Soaring, is serving two life sentences for murder in the Virginia State Prison. I'm Teresa Saldana. Join me again next time for another extraordinary journey into the criminal mind on Confessions of Crime.